Um, and thanks for everyone joining us at the end of the day. I'm aware that we are between you and uh, conference closing drinks. So uh, I hope this discussion is good enough that you stay with us until the end. Um, as I has said, we're going to focus today on how open data can be transformational for people's lives. Uh, I'm going to consider that by looking at the Open Active Initiative. Um, we've got three panellists joining us today. Uh, we've got Nick, who's the director of sport tech company IMIN. Uh, we've got Alison, who's the strategic lead for innovation and digital experience at Sport England. Uh, and we've got Jade Cation, who is the director of impact and innovation at London Sport. Um, at the end of the session, we should have some time for some questions. Um, but to kick off, I'm going to start with a really simple question for each of the panellists. Um, to help people understand what Open Active is, um, what is Open Active from your perspective and, and why is it important? Uh, I'm going to start with you, Alison. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Andrew said, I represent Sport England. If you don't know who we are, I guess we're nationally lottery funded. Uh, we're an arms leg body of DCMS uh, in government. Uh, and I guess our aim is to make it as easy as possible for anyone in England uh, to be physically active and to reap the benefits of doing so. Um, we've got a particular focus on inequalities uh, at the moment with our latest strategy. Um, but Open Active is something that is uh, quite close to our hearts. I guess we've been involved since 2016 uh, when we uh, formally kind of launched the initiative with the ODI. Um, for us, uh, what we see in the data about physical activity is that not enough people are getting those benefits of physical activity. Nearly 40% of the English popula population uh, just isn't doing kind of regular physical activity. And we hear time and time again that one of the biggest barriers to doing so is finding physical activity in their local area. So you'll ask someone sort of, you know, have you thought about physical activity? Absolutely, like no one says, I, haven't, I don't want to be physically active. It's that challenge of when you go online and you look for physical activity, uh, it's just not there. You know, it might be there in varying parts. You might get a phone number, you might call, it might be sort of uh, out of date, sadly. Uh, so what we've done, I guess, Open Active is all about making it possible for the sport and physical activity sector to open up that data, to make it available for anyone, whether you're an innovator, whether you're another sports uh, provider, to use that data in a way that actually encourages someone to be physically active. Great, so, thanks, Alison. Yeah. Um, Jade, I'll come to you next with the same question. Thanks. Um, so I work for London Sport. We're a charity. Um, it's all about the individuals that are in deprived communities, which face the biggest inequalities across London. And Open Active for us is about supporting the sport and physical activity sector. So if you're thinking about community organisations, your local basketball club, to give them the opportunity to market their activities wider than they're able to as individual sports or individual clubs. They, it's, it's about letting that basketball coach do what they do well and coach that basketball so that their, their, their activity or their opportunity can be part of big campaigns. They can um, get to more people that they would have been able to previously. And then from a participant's perspective, it's, it's about behaviour change. So people having the capability and the opportunity to go to activities. Um, if you think about, um, I was maybe not a good analogy for sport and physical activity, but just eat. If I want to order a pizza, I can find a pizza. There's so many different opportunities for me to get the local takeaway. I can choose gluten-free. I can choose pepperoni. I can choose you know, whatever cheese I want. But when it comes to sport and physical, act <coughs> physical activity, I'm rummaging through the yellow pages, I'm looking through leaflets, I'm spending 20 minutes trying to find something near me. Um, and it's, it's just not a great user experience. So it, it's bringing that to the individuals um, and, and getting our sector up to speed with other sectors. Thanks, Jade. Um uh, Nick, kind of the same question, but Jay's talked a bit about infrastructure there. Can you mm. kind of tell us a bit about that as part of your answer? Sure, yeah. Um, I, the folks that were in the room before, for the session before, I think open banking was discussed. Um, open banking is similar to kind of what we're doing here in terms of creating a standard way that big organisations and small organisations can interact with each other. And so where open banking, you've got those nine big banks, and it was about making sure there's a standard way of accessing the data in those nine big banks, it's, it's a little bit different in our sector, so we don't have regulation to force the big leisure operators, which are the equivalent, to do any particular um, building APIs, implementing standards, even participating in, in standards discussions. 
Um, but it, it, there's a real long tail of, of organizations in our sector, both those that are delivering activity, as Jay talked about, but also in terms of innovating to create booking systems or apps you can use to go and find what to do. And they're the organizations that we're talking about connecting together with the data standards. Um, and so it's a, it's a combination of um, read-only open data in the same way as open banking does that, and also read-write making bookings in the same way as open banking lets you do transactions. Um, and, uh, and so the standards are available, and what that means is that someone who's built a booking system can implement the standards and become open active compliant, and then anyone can use that information to build an innovative service, for example, the NHS or <coughs> Decathlon, if they're trying to engage their customers to get more active. Thanks, Nick. That's, that's really interesting. And that, that point about innovation, I think, is really important because innovation is a, a, a key enabler of transformation. Um, Alison, I think you've already talked a little bit about some of the changes that Sport England want to see, but I, I kind of get the impression this is change at a sector level. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I think what, as I said, what we see is sort of at the end of the day, we want that end user to be the one that receives the benefits of being physically active, but the complexity of what exists from a system perspective between, you know, sort of the, the start and the end of a user journey is, is quite complex. Uh, I guess we often describe the sport and physical activity as quite a fragmented sector. Uh, and I guess there's, there's a positive to that and a negative. Um, I guess the negative is that kind of the, the range and the breadth and the capability that you have in, in that sector is quite broad. You've got, as Nick said, everyone from big leisure operators that have kind of data teams, digital teams, they have the systems, like kind of they have the technology and the infrastructure right down to, I guess you've got your single yoga instructor <coughs> in a community hall who just wants to put something on for the benefit of the people that they love, like in their local area. And, and we want to support all of those players in our system to improve their capabilities to move forward as a sector so that we're continuing to meet the expectations uh, of just society, right? Like as Jade said, you're expecting to be able to find things online. Like, why can't you find sport and physical activity online? That's really important. Um, so, yeah, so I think there's the, the, that's the negative. But I guess, again, the fragmentation that we need is really important because as a user, if you think about you versus the person next to you, the way you'll look for information is different. The types of activities you'll need are different or desire are different. Your motivations are different. Like, well, there's no single solution here for individuals. So the fragmentation is important, but it's also how do we support that breadth of supply, if you like, to build skill and, and to improve. So, so you, you've got to talk about the, the range of providers that are in the sector, you know, from these, these large suppliers to these kind of individual yoga instructors. What, what's the level of kind of digital maturity like in the sector? Are, are, are these people chomping at the bit to publish open data or, 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 or is there less um, uh, commitment? Uh, I guess it's hard to generalise, isn't it? Like, so, but I'd say in the main, like you so said, we are, I wouldn't say we're lagging behind. I think there is sort of, there is a element of digital skill and, and data skills, um, but we could always be better. Like I said, and there is progress to be made. Um, particularly, I think, in Jade, probably you work very closely with a lot of those local organisations. Yeah, I guess at a local level, there's a there's an element of sort of unconscious incompetence as well in terms of the opportunity and potential um, that the organisations could get from being involved in something like Open Active and Open Data. Um, and there's there's definitely capacity and capability building in terms of. Um, a, if, if you think about that local basketball club again, um, they're not going to have um, the websites, they're not going to have the database, they're not going to have the understanding of what open data is. And actually, they, they, they shouldn't need to understand about what open data is. It's about us giving them the, the infrastructure and, and the capacity to be able to be involved so that they can get on with coaching basketball. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Um, so, so, Nick, can you... Tell us a bit about how Open Active is kind of trying to solve some of those challenges that Alison and Jade have told us about. Yeah, sure. So it's about making sure that there's lots of people in the sector that are already trying to solve these problems in different ways. And it's trying to create a bit more of a joined up approach. So when we started out on this journey probably seven something years ago, um, there was this real hunger for the just eat we talked about, right? People were like, why is it so difficult to book a squash court, for goodness sake, or to you know, find a yoga class? What, you know, if you're not using ClassPass or something like that, 
You basically didn't have any other options. And it turns out that's because ClassPass, venture funded, um, was, fen was spending a huge amount of money on individual integrations, something that you just couldn't do unless you had that kind of backing. And so there was this real high barrier where you couldn't get into that space unless you were willing to do all of this work. And even then, they couldn't get into a, you know, connected to a lot of the systems involved. Um, and as, 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 as Jade said, because there's a lot of individual instructors, there's lots of small booking systems, there's lots of SMEs, you know, there's three-person companies who've built a booking system. And they just you know, don't have the time to implement standards. You know, that's not something that's on their radar, really. Um, and so um, what we're trying to do is really create an opportunity for those organizations that are those SMEs, for example, um, who've got their small booking system that's in use by a thousand something different instructors, for example, um, and give them the tools so that they can really easily do something that it's already kind of been thought about. They just build these APIs in this specific way, and then they can become part of this ecosystem of lots of other people who are trying to get use that information to put them in, put, put in front of audiences to get people active. And so it's almost like connecting the SME on one side, who's you know, those three people who want to you know, help particular instructors make bookings. And then there's a SME probably on the other side, or many in fact we work with, um, who uh, want to engage a particular audience or demographic, or they've got a vision for some particular sport. There's one the other day came up, there's a, a squash, an app that helps you find squash partners, um, like yesterday, um, was, came across and said, well, this looks exactly like what we want. You know, the, can, how can we connect in? Because that's just a very small organization engaging a very specific audience. But of course, without the ecosystem in the middle, there's no way that one squash app is going to go around and get all the massive leisure operators and all the tiny systems, all these booking systems, all these uh, instructors um, or facility managers on board. Um, and so it's, it's kind of collective action, if you like. It's all of, the, all of the small systems that need to do the same thing in order that all of the innovators who are, who are looking at totally different slices of the data from lots of different systems can then do their thing. Um, and without that collective action, the, yeah, the innovation is, it doesn't happen. I was going to add to that, and where, where this really thrives is where we get a level of data and a level of data richness, which enables us to innovate to particular audiences', audiences needs, because the, the fragmentation of the industry is, is the challenge here, but it's also the opportunity, because when we have that level of data, we can create something that's specific for a specific person's needs in, the, in a specific place, and that's, that's where this starts to really um, mm. get to the opportunities that it, that it has. Mm. Well, I think one of our kind of priorities for the current phase of Open Active is uh, starting to, to, to look at ways we can use the data in new ways uh, for tackling disadvantage or uh, looking at uh, providing opportunities to different types of people. Um, I just wonder what opportunities you see in that space, um, Alison. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think uh, we talk a lot about, I don't know if people know the term social prescribing, um, kind of as an area that sort of, again, we hear this a lot because from a Sport England perspective, I guess one of our big ambitions is to bring the health sector closer to the sport and physical activity sector in the sense we're trying to achieve the same outcomes in terms of improving someone's well-being and sport and physical activity is a really strong enabler of that. And I guess if you think about kind of the challenges that Nick's described in terms of efficiency and sort of just an ease in which I can connect someone to the right opportunity, there are kind of social link workers out there. There are GPs out there that, you know, in the 15 minutes that they have to talk to someone in their surgery about physical activity, you know, how can we make that as easy as possible for them to actually offer physical activity instead of prescription. Uh, and that's something that we, you would have heard sort of that's something that the government is very supportive of. Um, and I think there's a lot of energy there, but again, there's a lot of complexity there. So I guess the further we can get closer to that common language that Nick was talking about, like kind of in terms of having 6,000 descriptions of swimming, let's have six, <laughs> or at least a way to connect those 6,000 descriptions then we can get closer to providing, kind of feeding that data into existing pathways. So I guess we're not about creating new ones uh, unless that's what a user tells us they need. So like kind of, but I think it's important that you know, something like social prescribing is definitely an area of opportunity that I think we're all keen to explore more. Uh, thanks, Alison. I'm going to take the opportunity to plug at this point. So uh, the ODI did some research into social prescribing uh, about 12 months ago and uh, tomorrow we're going to be launching an update to that research and a social prescribing data tool uh, and actually on the stand downstairs the open, is it on this floor 
It's been a long day. It's on this floor, isn't it? <laughs> Was it downstairs? Okay. Uh, too many building floors. Yeah, um, we, we've got an opportunity to, for people to, to look at that open, that open data-driven social prescribing tool uh, and to have a look at social prescribing. Uh, so please come and have a, a look at that at the ODI stand. Um, Nick, uh, one of the things I think is quite impressive about Open Active is it's been around for quite a long time. Mm. Uh, and based on past experience of kind of building data sharing initiatives, th th this is never easy, you know. Mm. Um, I've been involved in data sharing initiatives that are driven by regulation. And even then, it's hard to get people to publish and share their data. And I think coming to Open Active relatively recently, one of the things I've been quite impressed about is the community and mm. how active that community is. Mm. Um, you've been involved with Open Active from the very beginning, and I'm just interested how you went about in how you went about building the kind of Open Active community that wraps around the standards and the infrastructure. I thought you might ask that question. So I was trying to think how you could, I could ask that. So I've, got a few, I've got a few points to take you through. Uh, and so, so I, I think it, um, it started with, well, it really started with the grassroots movement. We were really lucky to have um, buy-in really early on when we, when a few organisations, including London Sport, actually uh, kind of came up with this, this notion that maybe open data could be applied in this sector and there might be something in here. Um, and also really lucky that Sports England were keen to listen to that you know, really early on. And all of this came about at the time when DCMS was forming its strategy for the next few years. Um, and so we were able to talk to DCMS about it. Um, and, and this was, I mean, there was a little bit of luck in that because I think the, the window in which that DCMS consultation happened, I think there was probably like a you know, decade in which we, if, we'd, we'd, if we did it three months before or three months after, it wouldn't have worked. But as it was, we got in there for the DCMS consultation. So that was really lucky. Um, and so it started off with that grassroots movement and starting with those organisations who kind of small voices, I suppose, but um, a, a, enough interest and enough influence in, in terms of getting the ball rolling. And so we started off with that kind of let's get in front of some organisations that have data and say, well, do you want to open it up? Shall we try and get a leisure operator, for example. Fusion Lifestyle has 40-something leisure centres. Let's see if they'll be interested in that conversation. And then, of course, the first thing you hear is the barriers, is the fear. Oh, but I've got this data. I don't want to open it up. It might be worth something. You know, it's just that kind of dusty thing in the attic, but maybe I don't want to get rid of it in case um, uh, I could sell it one day. And so you have to get over that. And so we did a little bit of work in terms of getting people to think, actually, there's something in this. Uh, and the first few people to share their data, that was a big step. But once that was done, they were willing to then help others follow in their footsteps. And so that was the beginning of the community. You had people saying, actually, I've done this. Why don't you do this too? Um, and, we, and we started to see SMEs using the data in really interesting ways. And so um, that was their, their, basically people building their businesses off of the little amount of data that was coming out at that time. And they also joined the community and said, great, we can, we can help as well. Um, and so you had some people who are publishing data, some people who are using data, all kind of starting to coalesce around this idea. Um, and we were also really fortunate because um, the ODI was involved and had some expertise. Um, Lee Dodds, if he's listening, was absolutely instrumental in helping us create some early standards, uh, which we could rely on Jason LD and schema.org and these other things. And so we actually had a really technically robust approach, which was really helpful because when we talked to technical people, um, it wasn't like a oh, you're just doing some standards thing. It was, oh, this is really interesting. So we started to get technical people who were interested in joining the community um, also. Um, and then, yeah, finally, uh, that leads us to kind of the bigger influences. So obviously with Sport England's influence, we ended up branching out to other national governing bodies and, and different parts of the UK's national lottery-funded sport infrastructure that were keen to push in the same direction. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great story of... Uh, people taking risks within their organization, even if you know there was no there was nothing in the job description it was just that you know people would we would just approach <laughs> in a cafe and say yeah, I know this isn't in your arena, but do you, you know do you want to think about doing something like this and then before you know it they started building entire websites and, and services around it and yeah and then they're, they're, they're really brought in and they're talking to their suppliers and putting in their contracts and and all this kind of stuff and so it kind of it snowballs. Cool, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm, I'm just going to obviously come to you next, Jay, to kind of follow <laughs> that lead that Nick's thrown down. Yeah, I was, I was thinking it was about finding some passionate people, right? Mm. Um, I was one of those mugs. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, finding passionate people and um, also in the, in the industry, in the sports and physical activity industry, where there isn't that much digital 
capability and capacity and expertise. There's, there wasn't, and it's, it's getting better, but there wasn't many people that understood it as a concept and the importance of it. So it's finding those people that had that level of understanding to, to see past the next funding application or getting 100 people joining in a, a session um, to think about actually how does data work in this world as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's it been like being part of a community of data geeks, for want of a better term? Yeah, um, see, I'm not, I'm not, I'm getting, I've become more of a data geek, but I'm not, when, when Nick started talking about sort of Jason and using Slack and all of this stuff, it was new to me, um, which is, which is um, really interesting um, I guess reflection on our sector and um, the progress it has made and still continues to make to to be able to benefit from something like data. Um, so yeah, it's been great for me personally in term, terms of learning. It's been great for the sector in terms of progressing its understanding. We're bringing more digital skills in all the time. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, so just to kind of finish off this then, um, I guess I'd be interested in your kind of hot tips for building a successful data community. <laughs> um, Alison, I'll come to you. Uh, well, I can see Rob is in the room uh, from ODSC, I guess. I was just thinking like we did, uh, during the pandemic actually, I guess we took a bit of a moment to take a bit of a pause because again, in that environment, it didn't feel right to be continuing to push, you know, for more data, more open data when a lot of the, the people we're talking about, I guess, were challenged to even keep their businesses going. Um, so we took a pause and ODSC did a, a really robust kind of independent review of the initiative for us. Uh, and I guess the thing that I took away from that is that we have a really strong, high quality data infrastructure, like there's no doubt about that. Um, but we probably went too broad with our kind of uh, use case, if you like, in terms of find and book, and that could be anyone for anything. Uh, and I guess we needed that. Like, and it's not to say that wasn't that was wrong. I think we needed that at the time to build the literacy, to build the understanding, to get the excitement and get the passion. Um, but my tip, I guess, would be to start smaller, okay. uh, actually, and sort of start with a very clear set of problems or user needs or kind of use cases that allow you to create these feedback loops. Because uh, I think that's where we have fallen down a little over the years is that we've done some great things, but you haven't able to be able to really evidence the impact in the ways that we need in order to build the initiative, to build the sustainability, to keep this moving. Uh, and that's where we're at right now. I guess it's that's what's really exciting about what's to come for Open Active, I guess, is we really do want still more open data out there, um, but we want more people using it is kind of where we're at. And we really want to kind of collaborate with anyone who is keen to use this data in whatever way. Like Again, it can be a really niche like kind of use case. Uh, I think there's so many. Um, but yeah, I think I'd start small. Is probably... Ooh, thank you. Um, and Nick, your top tip. Um, what have I not already said? Um, I, think, I think that passionate group of people, uh, as, as Jay put it, I think that, that would be my top tip is find, because it, that's funny, isn't it? There's, it's organizations, but at the end of the day, it comes down to people. You know, there's the people in the room who are gonna just get the thing done. And uh, I think that's, you know, what, if you can find some people in the sector who are particularly keen and, and hopefully have some kind of incentive as well. I mean, that helps because not every, some people are just keen and passionate, but some people actually also had a business interest or something like that as well. So that kind of cu coupled together. Um, and, uh, and that's probably the start of it. And I think when you, as you get going, leaning into um, where is the economic value and trying to help people to realize that, because obviously to start, you can start something with a group of passionate people, but to sustain it, you need the economic value. And obviously those people will move on or change roles or whatever it is. And then the people who come in to replace them afterwards will say, what is this thing? Why are we doing this? okay, so-and-so is passionate about it, but why should our business continue to invest in this area? Um, and that's where the economic argument comes. So if they've got a business case, then it's like, great, we're absolutely going to carry on doing this. Um, and uh, organisations such as London Support have, uh, have been doing just that. Great, and thanks, Nick. And then very quickly, Jade, your, your kind of top tip. I'd say as being one of the people that has had the blood, sweat and tears of being a passionate person is start by going and talking to people from outside your sphere. And um, because 
someone's always done some something in that area before going I didn't talk to people straight away from outside sport and physical activity and understand all the challenges and learnings and, and take them in. Um, so, yeah, go talk to people. Great, thank you. Um, so that's all the questions I've got. I think we've probably got one, time for one question from the audience. Uh, so has anyone got a question uh, they would like to ask us? Okay, we'll just bring a microphone to you. Thank you. I mean, I could personally ask three questions because I've got three different hats here. One is someone from a cultural sector uh, digital agency who's trying to do this in the cultural sector. The other, I'm a local councillor and, and my council could be involved in this. And, and the third one is that I'm a father and I'm this evening going to take my daughter to sports. And so I'll choose the <laughs> middle one. How are you approaching local authorities? I mean, my, the local authority I'm a member of is bringing its, its uh, sports centres back into public ownership. But there's no appetite for data whatsoever. So, so how are you, you know, yet local authorities across the country run lots and lots and lots and lots. So, so how are you approaching that challenge? Uh, and the subject is, can I help you? Uh, Alison, I'll, I'll defer to you on that. Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. I think we uh, should help each other. Um, yeah, I guess a uh, couple of things here, like, I guess as an initiative, so I guess the difference for this initiative to open banking with the regulatory stick I guess we found, or we decided, I guess, again, right or wrong assumption. I think we started with we didn't want to use that stick uh, in the way that open banking did because, again, it's about the end user that we want to support. Um, we have tried a few different levers, though, if you like. Sort of we laugh about kind of carrot-shaped sticks and things like that. But um, So I guess from a Sport England perspective, like, you know, kind of and through sort of engagement with the community, we have tried sort of improving the terms and conditions within our funding agreements, for example. I guess the influence we can have is when we fund somebody with lottery funding, which is meant to be for the benefit of the community, um, that we can uh, encourage. I guess we don't have the resource, sadly, to mandate, um, but we have very strongly encouraged that open data in general. So again, Open Active is one example of a data stand, but also 360 giving and kind of the whole load of data standards that I think the sector could benefit or local authorities could benefit from. Um, so we've tried that. I guess we've also got procurement toolkits where, again, we're putting in uh, advice about open data and open active specifically and encouraging that to go into contracts. So again, big investments in leisure centres and then people like I'm in, I guess, can have that influence at more of a grassroots level in terms of how do we actually implement this? Because again, we can put something in a contract and in a procurement toolkit, but you've still got that capability gap in terms of then able, how do we actually make this happen? in practice and again I mean you could talk for days about the legacy nature of systems in local authorities and the challenges that brings um, so yeah I think there's lots of I guess it's looking for all those different levers and I guess at the moment we're working with the ODI to think about policy in particular uh, and where else we can lever uh, influence across local government. But if you if you do if you are interested in anyone else listening to this who is a councillor because I know there's a few in the tech generally, um, just reach out because we've got some guidance we can send you and we'd love to engage in the conversation. And basically, give you the tools you need to have the conversation. If you've contracted your new operator already, we can do it post contract. If you've not contracted yet, then um, there's some stuff for that as well in the guidance. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Emma's on the stage, which I think means I we am. need to you finish. You know what that means. Um, <laughs> It's like you are between me and a glass of Prosecco. That's <laughs> a dangerous place to be. So uh, can you join me in thanking our panel today? Thank you. Thank you.